If you love zombie mecha and space bounty hunters they get the shit kicked out of them, then you're ready for the Myth Wits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring you the news and interviews from the Geekoverse. This week, a day late. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my buddy, Mike Kafis. I'm a nickel short, too. <laughs> well, that's not going to do. My other buddy, Jack Ballard. It's way more than a nickel. <laughs> and, hey, Mythwit's new buddy, Jake Bible. Hey, Jake, Howdy welcome. So, Jake Bible is is the Bram Stoker Awarded, uh, Award-nominated novelist, short story writer, independent screenwriter, podcaster, and inventor of the Dravel novel. Has entertained thousands with his horror, sci-fi, thriller, and adventure tales. I think young adult too, right? Uh, he yep. reaches audiences of all ages with his uncanny ability to write a, write a wide range of characters and genres. Jake is author of the best-selling Z Burbia series, set in Asheville, North Carolina. The best-selling Savage, Sa- I'm sorry, Savage Merc One, can't read, and uh, Rogue series, the Apex trilogy, Dead Mech, the Americans, Metal on Ash, and the mega series for Severed Press. We know somebody who works for, who uh, does stuff with Severed Press, as well as the YA zombie novel Little Dead Man, the Bram Stoker Award nominated terror or teen, I'm sorry, teen teen horror novel, uh, international haunt. Or intentional? God damn it! Can't read tonight. Intentional <laughs> army haunting. God, kill me. He does stuff. International <laughs> haunting is really scary. <laughs> <laughs> I am the ghost. <laughs> so anyway, enough of that. Welcome to the Myth Witch, Jake. All right, All right. thanks for having me. <laughs> so, so Jake, my first question, right out the gate: What is a drabble novel? <laughs> a lot I'm of like, work that's what okay. it is um <laughs> i um it, it's actually a drabble to start off with that is is micro fiction it's a story that is exactly 100 words um not one word over or under exactly 100 words and when i was writing my first novel dead mech i was using it as a writing exercise to just kind of get ideas down, characterizations, scenes. So I was writing these drabbles and it was just kind of helping me because in order to get to a hundred words, you have to edit right away. I mean, so I'm editing as I'm writing and then going back and cutting stuff out and tossing it here and there. And then I started to realize that some of these scenes I actually really liked and didn't want to expand on. And I had a good flow going with my exercise, so why not just write the whole novel that way? And that's what I did. I ended up writing an entire novel. There's 136,000 words, and the novel is broken up into 100-word sections, um, exactly 100-word sections through the entire thing. Hey, and um, hey. it, it's insane. <laughs> Wow. Jake, uh, I'm going to need you to go back in time. I need you to talk to my old English teacher, Ms. Bredenberg. I'm going to need yeah. you to let her know that this hundred word idea is a good thing because she evidently didn't like that when I tried it. So oh, I'm going really? to let you need you to go back there and tell her, like, look, this is going to be a thing. Mike is on to something here. Okay. Right. Yeah. So no, hundred no, word no term paper, right? Hundred word term paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's, that's, right, go. I got you. I got you. All right, so so in other words, so as I understand it, so Dead Mech was your first novel, and that's how you got started writing yes. novels with these with the hundred word drabbles, and then you just yeah. decided to put the hundred word drabbles together. Yeah, yeah, okay. pretty much. I, I I got in a flow, and um, I I found it was easy to intercut the different drabbles because you know one one would be about this character one would be about this character one would be you know diff, different point of view here and it it the, the way the way it kind of worked was i could literally i printed all of these out and would just put them in order the way i think they would read well and i could switch them out and move them around and when i kind of got that right order then i had a chapter in and just started kind of going from there and um it, it gives it a very kind of fast-paced um almost cinematic uh feel to it you're it's it's cutting scenes fast you know i mean 100 words boom here boom there you know back and forth so um, like the yeah, yeah, it, 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 it got me a nice following and people didn't hate it too much <laughs> wow yeah it um 
I know words goes by fast, man. Real fast. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, it also, I mean, it taught me a lot about writing because I had to edit, you know, to get to those hundred words. Cause I was faithful. I mean, you can go through that book and count each section and there's a hundred words in each section. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I really learned how to, you know, I learned economy of words even though the entire book is 136,000 words, which is not a small novel. Um, but I, I, you know, I really learned how to strip out all, all the crap in there and just kind of get to the story and get to the action and um, let the characters flow. So 136, that's a, that's a book. That's a, that's a doorstop, Jake. That's a big book. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, yeah. it's a big one. <laughs> that's what we call, we call that, we call that Sigler sized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 exactly. I mean, the majority of the books I write now are around 100 or not 100, around 75,000 to 80,000 words. Uh, and I'm pretty consistent on that. So I don't know if I would want to even tackle 130,000 words again. Yeah, yeah I, I find that I'm starting to like, so I used to, a lot of the books that are, you know, a lot of the your popular books, like say Ready Player One or, or The Martian or whatever. Most of those mm-hmm. hit around 100,000 words. That seems to be the industry or I don't know if it's still the industry standard, but I know as of like six or seven years ago, it was sort of the in- industry standard for genre books. If you went to a publisher they and, and you, were a new, you were a new author, uh, they wanted about 100,000 words. It seemed to be the, the benchmark. Uh, and I'm finding that, that uh, you know, it's starting to go down again, like uh, prior to, to recent years. So if you go back to like the 70s and 80s and, and before, you know, most of your genre fiction was shorter. It was... It it was like 80,000 mm-hmm. books like Dune and stuff, but, but you had plenty of books that right. were like, you know, 80,000, 70,000 words. Are, are we heading back in that direction or has the internet just opened everything up to where it's like free forms? Like it, it's, it, whatever it is. Yeah. And it, it really, I think, um, with eBooks, eBooks have brought, you know, pulp fiction back big time. Um, eBooks are now the equivalent of, you know, your pulp paperbacks. Uh, that, you know, used to be able to fit in your back pocket of your jeans and things like that. Um, you know, the reason that, that publishers way back when, you know, especially in the 70s and 80s, well, you know, and if you want to go way back in the 40s and 50s and all that, you know, we're cranking out short little novels is because they were cheaper to produce because paper costs money. Right. So, you know, it, 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 you know, it changed for a little while there because, publishers were trying to get more i guess value added so and the the epics were you know they thought readers wanted doorstops they wanted those huge thick books they thought you know the bigger the book the better the book kind of thing and with ebooks now you have no idea what the size of the book is unless you look at you know the you know description the information that tells you page count but most people don't pay attention to that all that much Mm -hmm. uh so your your shorter novels your 60 to 85,000 range in there um, are doing really well, especially for a lot of small press. And that's who I primarily work with. Um, You know, it's just, it's just easier to produce. Right. Right. So I'm, uh, I'm doing the math on this. I've been crunching some numbers here and uh, 136,000 words is uh, (laughs) 1,360 travels. Just, I just wanted to, give everyone an idea of i mean when you when you break that down to per drabble wow that's, I, that's I have a lot a big, of drabble the the actual physical manuscript of that is two giant binders you know those super thick binders that you walk through staples and you're like who buys those things those are massive <laughs> and i've got two of those completely filled you uh, know in a giant in a huge tote bag um yeah the manuscript is giant <laughs> and now I know I know a little something about you because uh, you you come to us by way of of Paul Cooley, so you can blame him for for you know being subjected to us. I blame him for everything. It's 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was he was telling me that um, that and this this I really this is one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about was that um, you crank out like a book is it a book a month is that is 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 yeah, that it, truth? This, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 about that. I mean, life and scheduling, it's, you know, it's not like I put out, you know, write 12 novels a year. But when I sit down to write a novel, it takes me about four weeks um, from start to finish, you know, really from start to submit to um, my publisher. Because um, I, I write full time. This is my job. 
Uh, so I have, I have the luck of that. So I sit down Monday through Friday, nine to five and I'm writing. Um, so if I hit 5,000 words a day, five days a week, three weeks is 75,000 words. Then I have a week to edit and send it off to the publisher and boom, <laughs> you know, usually I take, I take a week to decompress. So that's why there isn't like 12 novels a year. Cause <laughs> after each one, I decompress a little bit and then start getting the ideas for the next one going and, dive in and then four weeks later i've got another novel it's you know i write i write fast um and you know and like i said i do it full time so that makes a huge yeah, difference yeah. i mean i i sit down and it, i i treat it as a job so i have the work ethic that goes there but then i also i don't have a full-time job that you know i'm exhausted from and come home from and have to try and fight to write for a few hours and you know do that i did that in the beginning and so i totally understand i mean dead mech the, my first novel took me nine months to write um of course you know all those travels that's insanity too but it you know it took a while and that's i had a full-time job so right you, know. you come home you're tired yeah, you worked all I, day I do generally yeah and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any kids or not, but if you have to take care of the kids and, you yeah. eat, and there's dinner and there's, there's still household chores and stuff oh, yeah. and your weekend stuff and family stuff. Uh, and then it's like, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Oh, I finally get to, oh, I get to sit down and do some work and man, am I destroyed. I'm just in time to work. <laughs> exactly. Right, you know? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So Jack, do, do you think, does that sound like it beats insurance adjusting, you know, for yeah, I, I would imagine so. I, I have a lot of uh, work from home experience, especially in my line of work. And I've always found it to be a double edged sword because there was a lot of times where, oh, man, I'm getting stuff done. And it's like seven o'clock and I'm getting shit done. And, you know, the office is with me. And, and then there's other times where it's like three o'clock in the afternoon and I'm watching like a Disney movie and uh, I got my feet <laughs> up and I got like some tacos warming. You know, and I'm like, yeah, work it's great. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you have those kind of days too, where it's like, yeah, this, this, I, a, you know, yeah, there's I an think, alien I, I, uh, I, movie yeah, marathon on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. <laughs> and I tend to be a morning writer, so it's usually I'll get you know kids off to school, wife, my wife's a teacher, so get her off to school and everything, and then I'll sit down, start cranking out as many words as my brain can handle. And I'll usually walk the dogs about one. And if I come back and can still words, then, then I'll try. But after that, sometimes it is Netflix time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's just all there is to it. And, and I do the cooking in the house. So usually by three or four. Um, so gotcha. I, let, I yeah. let all the words go away and just start getting the tasty foods ready. <laughs> right. And it's, it, it, it's kind of, I don't know. I, I can't imagine how hard it must be, you know, for people who, who work a creative where they're supposed to be creative all day long. How, I mean, how difficult it is yeah. to be creative and create actual, like, um, real tangible work for eight hours in a day because it's just your brain just doesn't do that. You know, you have to inter intersperse it with, you have to have your creative bits and then you can do all your, like, maintenance type bits. Like, I don't know, you update your website yeah. or, you know, oh, exactly. yeah, so I got to handle my mailing list. Let me go check my emails. Let me, you know, all those things that you have to do as a business because you're your own business, right? Um, I'm sure you've right. got your, ta your tax stuff you got to take care of and, you know, and, and making yeah. arrangements <laughs> with your, you know, uh, with your publisher and all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. And I got to go do my business license and I got to, Oh shit. I got to back all my files up and make sure I back up the files. Cause if my computer goes corrupt and blah, blah, blah. And there's all that back end stuff too. Right. Oh yeah. Oh, completely. There's, there's totally all of that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, so that's all uh, that'll happen in the afternoons. Um, you know, cause like I said, I, I tend to be a morning writer. So yeah, that I'll, I'll do all the maintenance usually later in the afternoons. Um, or on Monday, sometimes, you know, I'll just do the grocery shopping. And by the time I've done that and get back and if there's errands and everything, it's already noon. And I'm just like, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to just do administrative stuff today. Monday's administrative yeah. day. So. Yeah. And well, then I don't have to think yeah. about it the rest of the week. I try and cram it in, you know, get as much done as I can all in one shot so that when I do sit down, then I can just focus on that. I don't have that to do list hanging over me or at least it's been whittled down where I'm not thinking about it. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, hey, let's get into. Yeah. Right, you know what? Let's get into one of your books. So, um, Mike and I. Okay. Uh, I I read all of Roke. Uh, Mike, how far did you get? Okay. 
I well, okay, so I wasn't able to get all the way through uh, to for um for, in, in time for this. I can't wait for this to be over so I can go back and and, and get that again. But um, I am about. Uh, I'd say a third of the way through, but then I skipped a little bit in the, near the end to try and see like where he was getting and, and stuff. So right. I have one big, while I have while I have uh, the the floor here for a second. I don't remember this in the beginning, so I have to know what is Roke's first name, or is that his first name? <laughs> That's his name. His, his name is his name is Roke. So so there's no he like Madonna and exactly <laughs> it's just Roke. Okay. Damn yeah, it. and it's yeah, actually it's kind just of like Madonna. Rokes. Yeah. You know, there's people who try and call they try and call him Mr. Roke, and he's like, no, it's Roke. Right. And, you know, that's it. Just Roke. Just Roke. Okay. <laughs> so All right. uh, yeah, now I've, I've only read I've only read the one book, and I don't want to spoil. Obviously, I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, and I know that there's a second book, right? Already, and I don't know if you're. Do you have a third, or is there going to be a third? I, I'm currently writing the third, actually, right? Okay. Like, while he's um, doing this show, it's going to be right. ready. He's, yeah, exactly. He's, over. <laughs> he's, he's doing a little drabble on the I'm, side. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, so my question is... Well, um, you guys talk, I'm writing 100 words. So. Right. right. Do, do, we, do we find out... Um, is is there is there a secret rope that we'll eventually find out if you stick with it, or is there? I mean, is there is there more to it? Like, is is there a last name that people could find? Is there any of that? That that's probably never going to be found. No. Okay. Um, I, I I I have an idea and I have a backstory, you know, in mind. Um, that's just in my head. I haven't written it down or anything. And so I kind of have an idea of what his background is. And actually in the second book in Nebula Risen, I from his past in, um, but still don't really explain jack shit. So okay. <laughs> no one's, and is no it, one's getting any closure or anything right. on that. They're actually going to get more. What? And is, um, is that part of his more questions? Is that, is that, and is that part of his charm? Is that part of the, 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 mystique to rogue i mean is that part of like if you yeah. told it would it would it ruin it kind of like midichlorians yeah exactly okay. i i approached rogue as as a crime novel mm -hmm. um so i was definitely taking a lot from um that genre especially you know from your you know 50s and 60s crime pulp stuff where it is the the kind of unknown loner um you know they may have first and last name, but you really don't know what their past is. You just know it's trouble and their trouble and there's going to be nothing but trouble you know, right. going on. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I approach it. It, it kind of keeps the mystique there. Right. Uh, so I doubt I could, if I write 20 Roke novels, I could pretty much tell you, I'm never going to say what his other name, if he has another name or anything right. there. So it'll always be just Roke. <laughs> is, it, is it Rosebud? No. Uh, so, so no, I got, I, so, right. So uh, I, I couldn't help but notice a similarity. You must be a big fan of payback because is there, is there a little bit of a, a love letter to payback in there? Oh, Oh, there's there's a huge, uh, you know, Richard Richard Stark's Parker novels are a big influence, um, definitely, and um, so yeah, yeah, certainly because yeah, Payback is based on on the first Parker novel, right. um, even though in Payback they change his name. I can't remember in the movie what they do. It's it's some other name. No, no, he's Parker. It's I think, no, and I can't. I think he is. No, he's not. He's not he's Parker. Not. No, he's it's a different name. Yeah, oh, I'm thinking, not, you know what? It's gonna drive me nuts. I'll have to look it up. I'm th there's another movie. I think uh, isn't there? Isn't there a? Um... Oh yeah, there's the um, the Jason Statham. Parker yeah, yeah, he's Parker. Okay, Parker. yeah, yeah. That's I'm cross threading it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So he's yeah. And, and that one's based on like the sixth or seventh novel in in the series and all that. I literally a good friend of mine, Patrick McLean, turned me on to the Parker novels, and I mainlined those things. I mean, okay. seriously, I like yeah. downloaded every single one and read them back to back. Um, I have to check summer, those out, honestly. Oh, they're because awesome. Payback is, dude. Payback is one of my favorite movies. I, I, find, I love that movie, man. I do. Oh yeah. And like, I'm listening to Roke, and I'm just like, oh yeah, I can see Mel Gibson getting get shit kicked out of him right now. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Although, I yeah, there's so, yeah, that's that's definitely. What's that, Mike? I don't see Mel Gibson when what? I see Roke. Uh, I think he's more of a Stallone kind of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, 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 he could be. 
<laughs> St- what, j- like Judge Dredd Stallone? That that yeah. that one? <laughs> which which Stallone? Just <laughs> bro- <laughs> just broke. <laughs> <A Rocky. laughs> so, all right. So I had another question about Roke. Um, so the the aliens in that. Okay. Uh, I, one of the things I kind of liked that you did is you didn't explain much of anything, which was cool. You just threw it out there and rolled with it. Like there's this alien and you said it as if we knew what that alien was and you gave some, you know, some description of it if it was important Uh, or maybe even you just touched on it like a a lizardy looking thing and then you moved on. And I thought that was kind of cool because sometimes in novels, like, like let's say, let's take Tolkien because he's like the king of this shit where (laughs) he'll say something and then he'll go into this big, long three chapter explanation. And all you want to do is, is fucking stick a knife. Like what page do you stop talking (laughs) about this so I can move on? Like I have an imagination. Just let my imagination do that. And you tell story. You know, so I thought that was kind of cool. But you have like a shit ton of aliens, man. Yeah, it's it's funny because Roke is actually the universe is part of. I started that in Salvage Merc One, um, and I don't do a ton more. I actually have done actually a little bit of cutting and pasting of the descriptions from that series okay. into Roke, just because they're just quick. I mean, I, I maybe give a paragraph if that, you know, maybe a couple sentences on each, but. The, what I've found, honestly, and especially since I tend to write action adventure, uh, regardless of what the genre is, if it's if it's horror, zombie, sci-fi, whatever, it's it's basically it's it's a thriller is what it's going to be, and you don't want to get bogged down with all the details on a character's appearance and everything, because realistically, the reader, I mean, I know as a reader myself my brain's going to invent, invent what they look like anyway. And it right. can be completely opposite of what the description is. I mean, I've had conversations with friends where it's like, oh yeah, blah, 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 this character. And da, 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 I really like this part. And they're like, what part? You invented that in your head, dude. <laughs> like, oh, <you're> not, okay. <laughs> well, that's yeah. a pretty cool idea, huh? Um, so, you know, I, I don't spend a ton of time on heavy description in my books just because yeah everyone's brains are going to invent what things look like anyway you're going to create that environment in your head uh so i just want to get on with the characters get on with the story get on with the action right right Um, yeah (laughs) yeah well i got a question for you jake because uh my first name is jack and so i've heard a thousand bad jack jokes about candlesticks and jill and (laughs) you know my name is a verb so with the last name Bible, what's the worst, dumbest joke you've gotten with the last name Bible and, you, and you're an author? You, you, you know what's funny is I don't get my – with the last name Bible, it's almost a hands-off word. Oh, um, wow. Most, yeah. Most, yeah. most people are just kind of surprised that it's actually a last name. But yeah. – making fun of it <laughs> okay all right, right away. Well, what is interesting yeah go ahead go ahead oh okay i i'm afraid you're gonna uh, just gonna say say, what, okay go. <laughs> oh, man, okay we have we have some bad uh, lag all right so what i think uh, i was hoping you weren't going to say is this because i was going to ask you i'm not making fun but i was going to ask you a question i yeah. incorporate a term this has to have been already incorporated has someone asked you are uh for instance the the roke uh, series and the mech uh series and all are they all part of the same bible verse <laughs> yes yeah. i've oh, actually oh, thought of using yeah. that myself oh no Did yeah you? no that's great i love it actually permission I mean, that's like the, the no that's the old <laughs> ultimate pun right there you know the, the yeah. bible verse and everything right. and i i actually would love to use that in descriptions but the thing is, it's going to offend somebody, <laughs> even though it's my own last name. Someone's going to get pissed off. Be like, but if it's so true. That's just, I, it's like, yeah, but it's, oh. you know. Yeah, well, so, well, I, well, I had a joke with the term Bible thumper, but um, I guess Bible verse will just stick with that. <laughs> That's probably better. <laughs> That's good. I'll, I'll tell you the one, one thing I'm asked a lot, which surprises the hell out of me is people have asked me, is it a pen name? And I'm like, well, no, I was born, I was born with this name. And if I was going to pick a pen name, 
why would I pick the last name Bible? That is just loaded as hell right there. That's nothing but trouble. I mean, and especially since, I mean, my, my books, you know, with the exception of a few here and there, my books are, are not exactly safe for um, <laughs> no. safe for work in any way, <laughs> shape right, or right. form. So, yeah, yeah, it, it just cracks me up when people ask me. They'll be like, oh, is that a pen name? Pen name. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. You know, you really it's lost me with this whole turning a rib into a woman thing. I got to say, like, it really kind of yeah. went me out when I got <laughs> there. You go. The talking snake was really kind of over the top. Yeah. It was really <laughs> yeah, too on the exactly. nose. I just... <laughs> It's like, I know it's fiction, uh, but that's a little too far. <laughs> right. I mean, come on. Yeah. That, that's all right, not so, in my Bible verse. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. I, there's a question, actually, uh, Jake. We, ha we have a chat room. We got a uh, couple chatters that going on. Okay. And Dad Game John has a pretty cool question, uh, and it has to do with um, the way that you're, you're writing style. And uh, he, he wants to know, uh, how do you start a new novel? Do you pick a series? Do you put uh, the protagonist somewhere and see what happens? Or do you work from a plot hook? Uh, do you pick up the trail from a previous book? Like, what do you, when you're starting a book, like, where do you start with it? Um, I, I have to figure out a hook. There's, there's got to be that first scene. Um, there's got to be something. And one thing I've, it, it, it's lucky. I mean, you'll hear this a lot. Uh, you know, writers will say, you know, start in the middle of the action. Um, usually, you know, a lot of new writers will start off and, and really you can take chapters one through three and throw them in the trash. And, and the book starts at chapter four. Um, because you kind of want, you want the reader to wonder what's going on. So I'll usually figure out whatever, you know, what that first scene is, um, try and figure out a hook. Uh, how, is there going to be action or is it going to be just, you know, something dramatic, something that's going to grab attention. Um, if it's part of a series and so it's the second or third or fourth book, um, sometimes it, it depends on what I'm trying to do, but sometimes I will kind of, you know, connect it to previous stuff. Um, that first scene started off that way just because, you know, we're in the age of Netflix and um, that applies to books now too. A lot of people will, will wait till there's at least two, three, four, or if not the entire series finished before they pick up a series and they binge read things. And mm -hmm. so I have to be very aware that, you know, I mean, I have over 40 novels out there so re realistically, someone's going to grab one of my series and read five books in a row. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm extremely aware of that, that reading behavior. Um, but as for, you know, it, it, coming up with something new, a brand new series or a brand new novel, I really have to figure out the hook. What's going to interest me? What do I want to write? Um, what's the idea that I think everyone's going to want to read that's going to keep them interested that's going to hook them and then try and build around that. Okay. Um, and that's, that's usually my launching point. And David Benavides, yeah. who is a big fan, longtime fan of ours. Uh, he has such a wonderful point that I just wanted to make. And that is that he is saying that you should uh, definitely kill the three of us in one of your books. Now I will say <laughs> you have a writer. We have a clause with that, that when, if we die in a book, that it must be scat related. Oh so, no, whoa, no, okay. no, no! We don't, no, we don't have that clause. That is not a clause that we have. It's only Cooley, yeah. then. It's only Cooley. Yes, that's <laughs> just in. Cooley's gonna it's put us. Cooley. Yeah, he's gonna put it in our. He's gonna put us in his next outbreak book, and that's how he's gonna kill it. Or, okay. or I'm sorry, the black, not outbreak, the black. So the next black book he does, uh, we're gonna die, nice. and it's going to be scat related. But that's nice. not everyone, Mike. That's just cool. That's just for Cooley. <laughs> No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Ugh. I don't think I want to die knows. like that. I, I can figure out something equally as um, bodily function related. All right. Hey, you, <laughs> take, oh, hey, hey, you can hey, top we're, skip. You, you Give it we're a game. Shot. We don't care. Bonus we're game. points if you use if okay. you use bird awesome. shit. Bird shit gets an additional ten points and an additional twenty points if it's bird shit on Mike. If if right. it involves a death with bird shit and Mike, additional twenty points. Or if somebody okay. dries Jack's body out, crushes it up, and smokes him, that would be fucking yes. killer, too. Yes, any kind of uh, meeting an intoxifying agent would also be voted for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, this is great. Yeah.
<laughs> and me, I don't care. You crush he, me. He has to die of technical difficulty. Yes. Something's got to die of anger. <laughs> right, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, like I I get, it out. And he, don't worry. Yes. If, if yeah, if if I get angry at a piece of equipment and wind up dying from it, that is perfect because <laughs> that's how it. Uh, that's, that's my life. All right, all right, all right. I, I, so, I can make that happen. Sweet, fantastic. Um, all right, so so uh, we we did a questionnaire with you, and and there's some questions that you wanted us to bring up. So I want to make sure that we hit those. Um, so why why the hell did Mech Corpse? Why did it not sell? Why didn't it sell? <laughs> That's a damn good question. <laughs> that is a question I'm asking myself every day. Um, I don't know. It's so bizarre because, I mean, honestly, it hit all the sweet spots. Um, I, I have, a, you know, a readership following that loves, you know, Mecca and, and all of that. I mean, my first book, my first series is is about Mecca, you know, Mecca and zombies. But still, it really is a military sci-fi, you know, novel. Dead Mech is is built around mech pilots mm-hmm. they're the characters um i've done fighting iron which is a far future mech western um which okay. sold great i mean that that did it you know that's awesome um i don't know i mean and especially since i i have plenty of military sci-fi books out there and military sci-fi is hot you know as as uh you know as a genre on amazon Seriously, uh, talking to Severed Press, we're, we're scratching our heads to this day how that book did not hit. I mean, it did so-so, but wasn't expecting so-so. I was expecting, you know, something definitely way better. It's it, it did it did poorly enough that we're we're really thinking there probably isn't going to be a second book. Oh wow! Um, okay, which would wow. yeah, which is just it. And I had a lot of fun writing that damn thing. Well, <laughs> I created these characters, I didn't, and yeah, I didn't get a chance to check out the reviews on on that. So, what, did the reviews come in bad, or was it just like it, it just sort of hit a no. hit a blank room? No, it, it just kind of hit a blank room. The reviews didn't come in bad. There aren't very many reviews. Hmm. Um, it just whatever the timing, and that's the thing. Success in publishing and writing is all about luck and timing. It really is. Um, I think we all know that talent is only a small part because there's plenty of blockbusters out there that, you know, are not the greatest. <laughs> it's not the greatest writing in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it really is luck and timing. And whatever happened, we hit bad luck, bad timing on that one. Um, it just it it never hit above a certain sales threshold, which was just weird. <laughs> so right. it's like yeah it was really kind of disappointing I've, I've written other books where i was like okay that didn't hit move on but this one i just i don't know i i i really thought it was gonna hit and i was looking forward to writing more and who knows you know the the, the audiobook is out and the audiobook is actually you know doing fairly well um so maybe that'll generate enough interest to, to write another you know print book and then put it in audio there too well, so yeah i was gonna say that there's also don't you know, it might, you never know, because like there are, there are films that they came out and bombed in the box office and mm-hmm. turns out, you know, their, their longevity. Look at, so look at Star Trek, look at the original, you know, the original series of Star Trek that didn't do great on TV. It did okay. Right. right. But there was nothing about that that would predict that we would still be going to Star Trek movies now, you know, with exactly different generations, one after another. And it, it would have like, you know, like millions of followers and entire conventions dedicated to it. Uh, novel series like, you know, it would just blow up into this humongous thing. Honestly, I think when they canceled the series in um, what was it in like 71 or something? I forget. I don't know when they when they canceled the series. It only lasted like three seasons, I believe. Um, right. I don't think any anyone knew that it had any life beyond that. Like that was it. It was done and they were going to move on to other things. And all of a sudden it yep. comes right back around. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, you know. who knows? It's, it's one of those things. And you know, it, it could be, I mean, we're not giving up on it. Um, so, you know, we'll try and do some promotions if we can get it. You never know. A, a lot of things come back to life with, um, you know, there's the uh, book bub out there that is a great promotional tool and uh, you know, it's a great newsletter that lets people know when, you know, books are on deal and that kind of stuff. And um, it's one of the few things, (laughs) few marketing tools out there 
that actually works in publishing. Everything else is really just the shotgun method. You just shoot at the target and hope you hit the bullseye. <laughs> uh, but, but book bug consistently for people seems to work. So who knows, you know, maybe Metcore will get a book bub and find an audience that way or something, or yeah, something will spark some interest. And then all of a sudden, you know, reviews will start coming in, sales will go up. Uh, okay. Yeah. You never know. It's, well, you know, who knows? Everybody listening to this, <laughs> go to Goodreads, go to uh, Amazon. Well, first of all, read the book and yeah. you know, right. take a review, man. Let's, let's, uh, let's take revive. Let's, let's have a core revival. There you go. Hey. Right. So, so, so speaking of that, I mean, this is a good transition. Um, you wanted to, uh, to talk about your adventures in building a mailing list, which is interesting to me because we <laughs> are trying to build a goddamn mailing list as well. And it yeah. seems to be, I, I don't know how to do it because we've got like, I don't know, we've got like six people on our mailing list. Um, so I'm like, how do you, how do you do this, this mailing list thing? And, and, and what are your experiences with it? It's, it's my experiences are it's hard. It's a lot of freaking work. Um, it's, it's one of those things. I, what's funny is I was in sales and marketing for almost a decade before I was in writing. And so, I mean, I understand the basics of marketing. I understand all those rules and, and, you know, consumerism 101 and, and everything. And it really doesn't change a whole lot from product to product to this, to that. There's some basic things, but the problem is, is that's a whole other part of my brain. When, when I switch to marketing mode, it shuts off novel writing mode completely. Yeah. They are two totally different things. I cannot do them together. So it's, it's the trick for me with the newsletter has been trying to figure out how to balance, you know, the need to be writing and creating and, you know, writing my novels with that administrative stuff, with hopping into the marketing, with trying to build a newsletter and, and all of that without losing the spark of the writing of the actual right. fiction writing I, and I have an newsletters. Idea. Trying to, yeah. I have an what idea. Why don't you include a free drabble with every mailing list? And you know, that's what, and what I'm slowly starting to do, <laughs> I'm starting to do, cause I do, I write them. I'd write a free drabble every Friday. There I you post go. it on my website. And so I've started including those in there. Um, I have another publisher, Bellbridge books um, that I'm doing urban fantasy with. And uh, they did a great giveaway promotion with um, one of my books, Stone Cold Bastards. And that generated, you know, quite a few hundred um, signups, subscribers. And I was able to get those names. I've been working with um, uh, b uh, behind the scenes kind of Facebook groups, other sci-fi author groups, things like that, uh, where we've been doing some, you know, big mass kind of promotions together. Uh, where people opt in and say, yes, I do want to hear more from this person or any of these people. And so I've been getting names from that. And that's really how I've been building it is honestly good old networking with uh, other authors, you know, who are, who are trying to do the exact same thing. Uh, so we're given more value by, you know, putting out contests and promotions and things like that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a slow uphill battle. And there's nothing worse than sending out that welcome email to new subscribers and then getting an email the next day from MailChimp going, you lost 20 subscribers. Awesome. Thanks. Oh, I, was, yeah. I was saying, I was saying welcome folks. Right. <laughs> trying, trying to be nice here and you just yeah. bail on me, whatever. All right. Okay. But it's, it's tough. I mean, there's so many authors out there who are just constantly they're, they're just moaning about the newsletter, trying to build the mailing list and do that. And I don't think anyone has found the sweet spot unless you're just, that's your thing. Right. Um, right. Some people love newsletters. <laughs> that's like, that's like their outlet. That's their thing. And it's like, awesome. That's great. It's not my thing. So I'm struggling on it. Yeah. Back yeah. when I used to promote bands and used to play in bands, we I have a dozen mailing lists and, I would find that people would say, oh, yeah, let me sign up for your mailing list and then never respond and never get them. And just kind of as soon as they come in, they'd be like junk. Yeah. So I'd have 200 people on a mailing list. and I'd send out an email and five people would show up and I'd be like, did you get the email? Huh? What? Oh, uh, no. You know, so it's like mailing lists. It's like, yeah, I, don't, I think most people read the first two uh, sentences anyway and then just like, OK, whatever. You know, so, I'm, you know, I'm. Starting yeah, to yeah, exactly. 
I'm starting to think, and you know, for all the ills of Facebook, right? I really think that that there is something good about it in the in this this place in, in creativity in that your interaction with your audience because it's 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 direct right no one has to look at your yeah. shit ever it doesn't come to them it's there if they want to see it. it comes up as a notification but they can just blow past that the way they do emails um it doesn't junk up anything um you know they they feel more in control and people are always always on the facebook right um yeah. I, just, I feel like that's I mean that's how we interact with our audience for the most part with our show and um, and, and it's not a ton of interaction but uh, th- there is some and like I said you know I posted this thing I got people we got people in the chat room this is actually more people than we get a lot of times uh, and I, it, I guarantee you it's because I posted on the Facebook post right before we went on because um, otherwise they wouldn't know we were right. going on tonight because we're always we're Monday correct. night so yeah. um, so I, I think you know for all its ills I think Facebook has a place it, it, it does, and and I'll, I'll agree with all its ills. I, I I'm not a big fan of social media, um, at at all. Just the the evils and the things that it, and yeah. just how it just brings out the worst in so many yes. people. Yes. But it it is it is the best announcement tool. Every time I have a new novel out, I can just do a couple posts, you know, over a couple days. Um, I use Twitter also. Um, and you know, I can do some posts, set up some posts during the day while I'm writing. Uh, so I don't have to, you know, hop back into marketing Twitter mode, um, and all that. And, and that, that definitely seems to work. I mean, the the statistics are, you don't really sell books through social media all that much, but I think, I think that can be, there's the caveat there is you're not selling to new people. Uh, but as a way to communicate to my readers that I've already connected with, yeah, Facebook and Twitter work great for me. Um, so I, I, I got to find that, that kind of happy medium of how to switch that over into the newsletter too. <laughs> I want to step in real quick and just ask you, uh, Jake, have you ever considered um, doing a Patreon for your fans? Because it's not yes. so that it's that it, you know you want to keep getting money and stuff. It's that that's kind of how you can develop a, um, a uh, like a mailing list, quote unquote. And then you already have a buy-in. You know, people are giving you eh, fifty cents a month or something. You know what I mean? Whatever it is, they they expect something. They're getting something. They're giving you something, and they're they're okay with you getting a little bit in return. Yeah, and I, I actually have kicked around Patreon and. Um... I actually had developed a whole campaign and everything and uh, launched it for 24 hours and then took it down (laughs) (laughs) because all of a sudden it was like, Oh yeah, I put all this work into it. And I was like, okay, I think I've got this dialed in. And then it was like buyer's remorse. As soon as I hit go, I was sitting on it and like literally went to bed and woke up that next morning and went, I'm not ready for this. (laughs) This is, this is commitment. Oh dear. Right. I'm, I'm, I write a novel a month, so I won't say I'm lazy, but <laughs> on, right. on the other side, getting me to do all the stuff that would go into a Patreon, even if I tried to strip it down as much as possible, would be like pulling teeth, and I would end up dreading it. And that's kind of what I was talking to my wife about that, and she's like, oh, yeah, you're going to end up hating that. And then you're going to end up hating the people who are on it, and that's mm-hmm. really not going to be good for your career because those are your readers. <laughs> We're like, oh, yeah. yeah, I don't want to hate my readers. I want to. So I ended up taking it down. I keep kicking around the idea of starting it again, but I've got to figure out how it to my style, my day, and where it's it's going to be fun because I want it to come across as as fun and not as a burden, you know. So once I can find that. <laughs> that recipe of how to make it fun for me and others. <laughs> uh, yeah. the, you know, I'm going to hold off right now, uh, but it's, it's definitely still in the back burner. Uh, you know, it's always there. Yeah. Something that's going to give you one-on-one interactions. It's going to allow you to interact with fans just a little bit, I think is going to be where your yeah. key is. Cause that's always fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and that's one thing I like about, you know, Facebook. And it's one reason I haven't just like gotten off Facebook completely is there's nothing like, you know, getting notifications or getting a message from fans. Uh, Same with Twitter. 
you know, people just, just tweeting about reading my books or something like that. That's, you know, and you know, I'll respond to everything. I I'm, I'm a talker, so I'll talk to anybody. Um, that's, so, yeah, that's yeah, a, you know, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It'll talk to anyone, even us. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Totally. Yeah. So, all right. So let's, let's, let's get to this a little bit before we run out of time. Um, so you work with uh, different small press publishers. So we know you got Severed Press, and, yep. and uh, as we've mentioned before, Paul. All mm-hmm. right, so Cooley's Cooley's on our show a bunch of times. He's been on our show a bunch of times. Um, so we talked to okay. him a lot. So I, so you I know poor bastards. That's why. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's why I keep <laughs> going back to him. Um, but I know he's on Severed Press. Did now? Did you turn him on to Severed Press? Yeah. Did he turn you? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So so you work with Severed Press, and and who else do you work with, and how does that work between the different publishers? Um, I have, I worked with Permuted Press, uh, briefly, um, I have a few novels out with them. Um, and that's where my YA and, uh, middle grade series are. Um, and, and that was okay. They were, they were a small press trying to act like a big press and they were, they got bought by a larger media company. So I think their growing pains were just a little too much for me to handle. Um, Severed Press has been awesome you know, working with them, we just crank books out and have a pulpy good time. Uh, Bellbridge Books is who else I'm working with. And uh, I got turned on to them through the author, um, John Hartness, uh, who writes a lot of urban fantasy. Um, He lives here in North Carolina, over in Charlotte. And we've just met through cons and things like that. And they, Severed Press has a very, they, they, I don't want to say narrow focus, but they know what books they want to put out. They know what genres they want to put out. And I just had a couple urban fantasy ideas, it, you know, just percolating that wouldn't let me go. Um, and Severed Press doesn't really do urban fantasy. So John turned me on to Bellbridge and they're totally, that's their wheelhouse. Um, mm-hmm. And they're way more like a traditional, you know, New York publisher. I mean, the way they do things, it's, you know, you write the manuscript, it goes through, um, you know, story edits with the, with the editor, copy edits, proofreading, you know, this, I mean, you know, it's, it's a long drawn out process and, and in a good way. And so it's, it's been totally different working with them because Severed Press is way more gorilla. I mean, I hand them a manuscript, they get it to the proofreader, the proofreader makes sure the commas are in the right spot places and words are spelled correctly and it's not you know we wipe out as many typos as humanly possible (laughs) and then we crank that puppy out there i mean literally from the point i hand severed press a manuscript to the point it's published is usually a month um that's about you know that's how much i mean it is fast which is great because that's how my mind works. So partnering with them has been awesome. It's like, I got another idea. They're like, good, <laughs> write it, go for it. Yeah. And then Bellbridge is way more like traditional publishing. Um, so it's been kind of cool being slowed down in a good way uh, because you know I've definitely learned a lot more. Um, the editor I work with there, she's awesome. Um, and she's like, I know this is jake voice and this is this is how you write and these are great you know this this style but she's like i also know our readers are going to pick up on this and this and it's gonna bug them and i'm like oh well that's good to know that's that's why i'm going with you guys point point these things out i do not want to bug the readers and so we go back and change some story things and change you know have some different stylistic choices um, you know, way more in-depth editing than I would with, you know, the, the gorilla pulp of, of severed. So it's two totally different worlds and it's been a hell of a lot of fun. Um, right. I, I, I don't know if I necessarily like either way better than the other. They're, they're very different ways, uh, to put a book out and, um, they have their pros and cons. So I'm, I'm glad I get the experience at least, you know, it's great. So I was reading this update from uh, from Sigler. So Sigler has been doing his patio. You yeah. know, he's been doing podcasting forever, podcasting his novels, and uh, so he yes. podcasts them, and then he got his deals, and he puts them up as audio books, and, uh, and and you know, and, pay, and, and print books and stuff. And he's with publishers, and he's made all these deals with uh, the companies that he can podcast any of his books that he puts out that are published. But their model just changed. So apparently, the way they're doing things now is he's pulling down all the podcasts of all the 
any sequel book that he has. So he's doing the first one's free model where he's going to podcast right. all the first model, first books in a series. So, for example, Earth Core, he's going to keep Earth Core as a podcast and, and an audio book. But uh, like Mount Fitzroy will not be a podcast. It will only be audio book. Um, and, that, and he said right. that's their, their model. And they're they're not doing the Patreon model or anything like that. So it's, it's interesting how every author has their own way of doing things. Like Cooley's got his own way. He's a Patreon guy. So he And Phil Rossi, he's yep. a Patreon guy. And that works for them. That works with them really well. They, they're actually using the platform nice, quite nicely. Um, but that's yeah. their flow. And that's the way, you know, it works for them. Um, so... Uh, I know you have a podcast, um, so uh, uh, Mike. I, I know we had some other stuff on here, but we're getting kind of late. Can we? You all right? Okay. You cool with me moving on to the podcast? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Sure. Okay. All right. So let, let's ask you about the podcast. So you do have a podcast, okay. um, uh, writing in yes. suburbia. So, so tell me about tell me about your podcast and, and how does that play in with your novels and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, it's it's the writing in suburbia is is really just me talking as a full time writer. Um, still. <laughs> living life. Um, and you know, I'm, you know, and here in Asheville, North Carolina, and I live in a subdivision, it's as cookie cutter as it gets. Um, and it's just, it's just my perspective of just being a writer and day to day, still having to vacuum the house and walk the dogs, right. still going grocery <laughs> shopping, you know, still cleaning the carpet when one of the dogs pukes or something like that, you know, just all the, you know, there's all the, all the myths of being a writer that's out there. And, most of those myths have to do with, you know, the New York ideal. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's kind of, that's sort of the myth, you know, that, you know, oh, I got my book deal and now I can quit my job and I can, you know, drink <laughs> yeah. wine and eat cheese and be cool and all <laughs> right. these things, you know, you know, you know what I mean? It's that, yep. it's that stereotype. And that is, yeah. the more writers you meet and, you know, you get into the business, <laughs> That's not how it is. The, the yeah. point one percent live in their lives. So yeah, exactly. Uh, so writing in suburbia for me is just a way to talk about being a professional writer. Um, you know, just kind of give some insight and my take on things uh, for others who want to be professional writers, who want to make a little money at it, um, or for even for hobbyists who just want to be more serious about their writing. Um, and, and honestly, it's, it's therapy for me because really half of it is me ranting about stuff that I go on tangents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I have to bring myself back to my quote unquote topic, um, <laughs> that I have. And it's, it's completely, it's unedited, uncensored. I literally hit record and then hit stop and then upload it into the world. Yeah. And that, that's what I do. So it's completely nonfiction. It's just me talking. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's, cool. you know, I started in podcasting. I mean, that's how I, you know, I podcast my first novel dead mech. And so I started in podcast fiction. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we know. A of work. Yeah. 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 Familiar. It's a Familiar. massive. So, um, no, yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, yeah, uh, you know, I've, for me to just BS. <laughs> I've started, um, I've started playing around with, with something, uh, I don't know how long it's going to go or, or what it's going to involve. And it, it has nothing to, there's no, uh, there's no schedule on it. There's no, there's no limitations or, or expectations on it whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to start streaming video to, uh, the, my studio 187, which is where I produce everything through, uh, I have a Facebook page for that. And I'm going to start streaming stuff you know, video using the live streaming. Cause we, the, what we do now is we capture the screen and then we stream it to Twitch, but I can do the same thing and stream it to Facebook. And it's something I'm playing right. with. I want to see, it's, it's an experiment too. I want to see what kind of viewership I would get if we put videos on Facebook rather than other, lo, you know, other locations, because yeah. right. uh, I put just a test video on there and I've already gotten more views on that than half the freaking videos we get on YouTube. Right. So I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Is this a better media? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm going to play with it. Uh, but the beauty of it is, is I don't have to put out a show on any schedule. If I do one a month, if I do one a day, it doesn't matter. There's no time limit. There's right. no time I have to be on. And there's, zero editing and there's no format it's me just fucking turn the camera on and go hey i'm right. i'm working on i'm working on cuba death tonight and i had this really cool idea about cars i want to share it with you guys get your feedback tell me what you think because i also make games and stuff and you know and then just cool. get feedback from people as i'm creating stuff invite them into my office as i'm working um and, and 
or just just vent. You know, it's like, oh, I just created this thing right. and I tested it and the fucking thing didn't work. I spent months working on it. What's wrong with me? You know, um, some, something along those lines. And I just thought that would be a fun little project to do that does that won't eat really won't eat any more of my time because it's just, you know, it's just something I run while I'm doing. You know, and and um, yeah, exactly. So is that kind of what you're? Which you know, you just get on and you just start talking. Yeah, that's that's okay. that's literally what I do. Um, I, I have an idea of what, you know, like a main topic I want to hit. <laughs> it's usually each episode's usually about an hour. So, you know, I have a main topic, but then I also have a list of things. I mean, like, honestly, I can look at, you know, kind of how I, I do it. I, you know, I talk about my morning routine, you know, what I've done so far in the morning, which is usually packing lunches and getting kids off uh, to school and all that, get my wife off to school. Um, you know, what project I'm going to be working on for the day, what housework I have to do for the day, you know, things <laughs> yeah. I got to, you know, get done. Um, you know, I make, I make a living at writing, but I'm also very lucky <laughs> to have this job. Can I know that? And so, yeah. um, I I'm very grateful. So I, I, I make sure that um, my to-do list gets done. <laughs> during yeah. the housework and the things that need to be done because you know my wife is a public school teacher she works harder than you know 99.99 percent right. of the population of the planet yeah. out right. there at a thankless, a thankless job, job right job yep, yep. yep. <laughs> yep. exactly right yeah. there so Su yeah, super important job it. it's a super yeah. important job that nobody gives a shit about right it's like one of those yeah. conundrums yeah. It's it's only the entire basis of our civilization and society. Right. Exactly. That's right. all. Right. You know? yeah. That's all. Because yeah, you know, yeah, everyone could be what they are but, without school, but right? Jake, sure. she she <laughs> makes the she makes the sweet cash, man, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. yeah, we laugh about that. I live in North Carolina. You know, they're forty eight on the list of you know places and Asheville actually it's crazy Asheville actually got um, voted or voted or whatever there's some analyst company that went through the entire country the worst city in the country to be a public school teacher wow oh great yeah that's, that's a distinction <laughs> so, so yeah. I, I do my I do my chores I do my chores right. when the chores need to be done yeah. <laughs> so, Wait a minute, it so beats out <laughs> it beats out inner city Baltimore hmm that's interesting. It beats out <laughs> everywhere. Everywhere. Oh, wow. It's Fantastic. the worst because they take in all kinds of factors. There's, I mean, the, 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 the demographics here in Asheville are interesting. It's a very segregated um, town. Uh, there's a lot of challenges. Um, it may be, you know, cool, hipster, tourist, hippie, artist, you know, bluegrass music, fun in, you know, the Blue Ridge Mountains here. But it's still a city that has to function and run with all the problems that come with that. Oh, yeah. um, it's also quickly becoming the Appalachian Aspen. Uh, so it's really? making a oh making a living wage here is near impossible. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, home, home prices, everything are skyrocketing. Oh, good. So it's getting being gentrified. A, being a public school teacher, yeah, yeah. Oh, big time! It's insane how gentrified it's getting. And so being a public school teacher, which is one of the lowest paid jobs you can have as a professional in one of the lowest paid job in one of the lowest paid states, really kind of just balls yeah. it right up there for Asheville. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I keep my wife happy by making sure the vacuuming is done when she gets yeah. home. Take a little stress <laughs> off. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So there you go. Yeah. And so All right, I so think writing in Suburbia, my podcast so is like my therapy there. Yep. So. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. So there's one other thing that you mentioned that I, I'm kind of interested in talking about real quick because I know we're running out of time. And that is that you've been doing a lot of studying and uh, feel free to let us know how you've been doing that. I'm looking into yeah. uh, maybe making a shift from um, just writing novels into um, like TV and screenplay writing and things like that. Uh, I was just wondering, yeah. you know, uh, what have you found so far yeah. that it's different uh, as, a, as a traditional novelist as to trying to move into writing for TV and like, you know, where are you in that journey and what have you learned so far? Um, it's it, once again, it, it, the, the similarities are it's luck and timing and it's networking. <laughs> um, I've gotten all the breaks I've gotten in, as a novelist have become because of connections I've made. Um, and honest connections. That's the thing. When you do cheesy networking, just network to network to try and get something from someone 
you're not going to get it. Um, but honest connections with people, that's how I've done it. And that's the same thing kind of with, with writing for TV. Um, I've got a friend who has a friend who's an agent <laughs> and a TV agent and just happened to like my stuff. Mm. Um, I wrote a pilot script. Turns out he really liked the pilot script. Apparently I can write a pilot script. Um, you know, those, those skills don't necessarily translate. But I've always been inter into film and television. I've always kind of, you know, over the years, studied screenwriting. Um, so once you kind of get used to the different format, uh, it's really not that hard. I tend to write like television anyway. Like we said, you know, I, I don't put a ton of description. Um, just like in, in, in a script, a TV script, you're not going to put a ton of description in there. It's going to be minimal. You want to get going. You want to get to the dialogue, get to the story. Um, and you don't even put a lot of description of the story because that's what the actors and the director bring right. to it. So you're really writing this, this great, it's like just a super fun, glorified outline um, with all of your dialogue already scripted out. Um, and I love writing dialogue. Dialogue is one of the, you know, one of the reasons I write. I like witty banter. <laughs> I like, <laughs> I like a good one liner. I like a zinger. I like, you know, something like that. So, you know, writing it, transitioning to script writing wasn't that hard other than just God, getting used to the format of, you know, I mean, there's, I have software that does it, but even still, you still are clicking going, okay, now I'm doing scene change. Now I'm onto this character. Now I'm going to action. Now I'm, it's not as organic of a flow as writing a novel. Um, right. But as for business wise, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. <laughs> right. It's, it's a ton of, yeah, get that script written. Let's get it out there. We're going to do rah, 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 rah. And now we wait and it could be months before you hear anything. All right. That's okay. If, if anything, right. Cause, <laughs> just, just cause from what I've yeah, heard, if, if anything, cause from what I've heard, they yeah. can be, they can option it and they can be all like in yeah. the process. Like, yeah, we're going to do this thing. And then it just disappears. Vapor. It isn't, it, and, it isn't and, happening until they've yes. got cameras on. Right. Yeah, ex exactly. And it, it is. And even then, you, you go from optioning, whether it's optioning the book to optioning the script that, you know, I've written uh, to then you go into development if they've decided, you know, they want to develop the pilot. And then from development, you then they have to green light it and say, yes, we actually want you to shoot it. You've developed it well enough. Um, and then once you shoot it, then they still can say, no, we don't want it. Even after right. the pilot, you know, episode, that's why there's a bill you go on YouTube. You see, there's actually some awesome pilots that you're like, why isn't that a series? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you right. know, and so it, you can go through, there are so many processes you have to go through to get to even get to a, a simple, you know, yes to one year, you know, worth of episodes. And even then it can end up getting canceled. There's, I mean, Hollywood is made up of no, lots of no, and all the many stages you get to that no, basically. You might jump through six hoops and be like, yeah, I made it through the sixth hoop and then slam into a no. And that's just how it is. Yeah. Um, okay. There are script writers out there that literally make a living writing pilot scripts, developing pilots that never get produced. Right. It's, I mean, it's honest. I mean, it's, they make a living doing that because, you know, it pays well enough. It does. Yeah, I heard um, that, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've, it's, I've, it's, it's crazy. There are actually people doing that. Yeah. I've heard of, yeah. uh, I've heard of people who, uh, I was, uh, I forget who I was talking to, but it was, it was an author and he was talking about another author that he was friends with. And the guy had, had a book had been optioned for like 20 years that kept getting optioned over and over yeah. again. And, uh, he, he asked me, he said, are you, uh, aren't, don't you get tired of like, you know, your book being optioned and then it never gets made in, into a movie. And the guy's like, hell no, man, I get a check every three yeah. years and yeah. it's a sweet check. He's <laughs> exactly. like, I hope they never fucking yeah. make that movie. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that, that's good stuff well and that's and that's the thing is really it's just it's just money on the table there because if you've already written the book then the majority of the hard work's done so if someone's gonna just hand you money just to say hey we want to make this into something else at some point maybe 
Sure. You just keep giving me the money. I would love that. That would be keep, awesome. Keep writing the checks. Yeah. All right. Exactly. Sorry. I hate yeah. to be bad. Yeah. Yeah. Here. No, no, right. it's good. We're on time. We're on time. All right. So, so Jake, uh, I'm going to throw out some yeah. links here. Make sure everybody you go to jakebible.com. That is the home base where you'll find everything. Uh, if you want to talk to Jake, you can, you can find him on Facebook and it's, uh, it's facebook.com forward slash Jake Bibles Wasteland. Um, and the links are, of yep. course, are always down here. Uh, and then on Twitter, he's at at Jake Bible. God, that's hard. How, how did you, you know, how, how could we get that right? But uh, <laughs> is, is there any other links that, that we missed? Because I think that's all we had, right? Is that it? No, that's that. That's it. I mean, everything. You can find it on my website, jakebible.com. Okay. I've got, yeah, everything there. Um, right. So, yeah, that's usually the easiest. And Fantastic. I also... Before we hit the outro, I just want to take a moment and thank uh, Dad, Dad, where are you? Dad Game John and Big Bad Davey Benavides for jumping in the chat room tonight. Uh, tell your friends, tell your mama, get everyone else. And speaking of mama, Mama Marsh, my mom, who always watches the show, was not in tonight. And she knows we have the show, Mom. God, that's right. You don't, <laughs> you don't get a mention of the show. And um, Mike, would her connection be better because she's just one town over from Jake? Yeah, should be. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's how the internet works, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, exactly. Jake, Jake, did you get a knock on the door? She was going to watch the show. No. Right. <laughs> I know. Could have invited uh, her over. Jeez. <laughs> and uh, you can find me at uh, at Mike Kafes, M I K E K A F E S. And please uh, follow at Mythwits, M Y T H W I T S. And uh, take it away, Peter. All right, everybody. Well, Jake, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, I am going to run Zach Loza now. Um, <laughs> d -d 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 starting, uh, and, and hopefully starting next week, we'll get our game show working again. If, if people are watching, we've, we've, we've had the game show. I just want to make this announcement real quick because we've had the game show off the air basically for the past couple of weeks. Uh, we were experimenting with something new. It didn't work out. Hey, one of those ideas that doesn't work out, right? <laughs> Um, so we're, we're going to go back to our, uh, our previous format with a slight change. So, uh, so for fans, anyone watching the show, it's going to be a little different. What's going to happen is you're going to be watching Twitch. Uh, the interview will end. The whole show will come to a close, but stick around because, uh, everybody's going to stay in the room and we're going to start up again within like 10 seconds and then the game show will start. So that we'll have like a, we'll play a game with our guests. Sorry, Jake, we couldn't get that in play, uh, uh before you came on, but it's, yeah, it's no. dude, it's been a, <laughs> yes. it's been a fucking headache and next week is a crap shoot yeah. i don't even know what's gonna happen next week but that's our plan <laughs> that's our plan mike, so we hook, mike, we hook mike's nipples up to a car battery and then for every every wrong answer we drip them in water just like in that lethal weapon movie yeah we did so we've been having the hardest time getting nice. the tasers right and mike's nipples are so chafed so once we get this all figured out it's going to be really fantastic right this yeah yeah Show awesome. <laughs> right, so, so anyway, all right. So that's it. That's it for announcements, everybody. All right, everybody. You have just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits Podcast. Catch us live on Twitch Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Yes, Mondays, not Tuesdays. This Tuesday, but not next Tuesday. Uh, jump into the chat room and ask our guest questions if you miss our live show. You can always catch the Encore episodes on YouTube forward slash Mythwits. Uh, find us at Mythwits.com and on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, as I said, Twitch, and Podbean, not SoundCloud. We're off SoundCloud. SoundCloud is fucking circling the German drain, as it were. Uh, do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. Please give us a bunch of stars and a review on iTunes. And we got a promotion coming up, but that's going to be a little ways off. We're going to start giving shit away for giving us uh, uh, promotional stuff. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, screenshot it, post it on our Facebook page. And currently, I'll send you something special. I'll send you um, some Mike Mike's bird poop. I'll scrape some of it off of his uh, thing and <laughs> send that to you. All right, yeah, we got plenty. Plenty of that. Plenty of that. Uh, Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. If you like us, you're bound to like other shows there as well. Check out TSRPN.com. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Make sure to check out Studio187.com for more cool stuff. And please sign our mailing list. Right, Jake? Our mailing list. Uh, exactly. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike? Just Roke.